Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This will be Romans part 39. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to just feast together uh, on your word. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth for you are our one teacher for it's in Christ's name I pray Amen if you've been following along in uh, these studies we're studying together verse by verse in the epistle to the Romans and in our last study together we were in the area of verse 15 Romans chapter 6 verse 15 what then shall we and uh, the the heiress describes the action as a single simple event without reference to duration you know such as I made this video that would be an heiress shall it function operate out of the flesh the sin nature the old man because we are not under the law just law that's not the law it's not articulated but under grace god forbid verse 16 know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey either the old man or the new man his servants ye are to whom ye obey that's the word obey is to come under the intense hearing of another whether of sin unto death the death of the cross that crucifies self this is the context folks or of obedience that's again the intense form of hearing unto righteousness which can only be produced in and through the sinless new nature. This is where we've where we've come in our text. And the text always, almost generally always has primarily has ministry in mind. It is an, it's not some exhortation to the world in, uh, regarding sin. It's not saying that because we are under grace, well, then we should try harder not to sin. That would be law. Antithetical to grace. We're double speaking if we say that. It is teaching us the ineffectiveness of our operating out of the flesh, the, the sin nature, as some call it, the old man that has been, as we previously were told, crucified with Christ. Serving working worshiping god out of the flesh the the old man sin nature the law it only produces death not the righteousness of god that is based upon faith T to sin in the aorist tense in the grammar here in the sense that this is what we may or may not do it's a it's in the subjunctive mood not the mood of uncertainty not the indicative mood the is to have determined at some point in time to live according to the flesh or the law we know that the strength of sin is the law the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law first corinthians fifteen fifty six yielding and that that word yielding that's a present active indicative our members as servants to sin is yielding our members to the flesh law keeping the old man as a rule of life now I haven't looked forward to this particular portion here the word obey obedience does not imply law keeping as a rule of life in fact it does not infer doing anything at all the Holy Spirit didn't mince words he didn't he did not use the word do which is poyo but obey hupakuo 
the most intense form of the word here. The word here is a kuo, and the one that we are to listen to intently here is God. Folks, this is what makes verse-by-verse -verse study so vital, so beneficial. If we didn't have a proper understanding of the previous five chapters, and especially the previous 14 verses, if we didn't have that as groundwork, we would have no ability whatsoever to understand what the text is telling us here. Our present text stands upon what we have been told in the previous 14 verses of chapter 6. The text here is teaching us that we may function out of either the old man or the new man. Keeping that thought in mind, let's let's read let's read these two verses again. All right. What then? Shall we live according to the old man? Sin, shall we sin? Because or be involved in the sin nature, the old man, because we're not under law but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. What sphere of existence? are we going to live in? Just what would we think we were being told if we did not consider the context? If we simply took these two verses out of context, well, then on the surface, it, what it, it would appear to be saying is something like, even though we are under grace and not law, then we should make every effort in our own strength not to sin. Well, but then we, we need law to come in to do that. Uh, we are not under, we're not under law, but we must still make every effort to keep the law because if we do not, our sin will result in death. Our obedience to God, you know, our own works, if we take obedience as, as doing, actually produces the righteousness of God. Just because we're under grace does not mean we must not still keep the law. And I've actually heard people say this. I've actually heard people interpret this passage that way. Now, I, I hate to have to slaughter one of modern Christianity's sacred cows here. It's... I, but, folks, obey does not mean do any more than dog means cat. If a soldier is obeying his superiors, he is listening intently to the orders that he's being given. Whatever action that follows is a result of that obedience, which is where the word do would then come into play. And if obey meant do or vice versa, folks, the Holy Spirit of God would not have determined to use definite words defining both. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, that's the intense form of hearing, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience, there again, the intense form of hearing, unto righteousness. Really listening to God unto righteousness is what the text is saying. In the original text, we, we can also see that the word under, where it says we are not under law, but under grace, it, it actually includes the exact same word, hupo, which is part of the compound word, hupakuo, obey. 
the the Greek word obey means to be under the hearing of another and hupakuo is the intense form of the word hear akuo so we need to take note of the fact that for the first time in the chapter the word sin is not articulated in verse 14. It's not an individual sin that's going to have dominion over you. We have already, folks, we've already been taught that the old man does not have dominion over you. I prefer to call it what God calls it, the, the, the old man, some, some say sin nature, that you have put off and a new man that you have put on we are not under the dominion of the old man. The absence of the definite article doesn't mean you can insert the indefinite. However, it is, it is proper in that verse that a sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under that sin, but under grace. In that verse, sin is not articulated but it isn't that sin it isn't that sin that has dominion over you it's grace that has dominion over you you're under the authority of grace and the obvious question then is well shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace and the answer, of course, is may it never be, or, or God forbid. Looking at the 16th verse, you ought to know, and the word know is oida, perfect knowledge, not experiential knowledge, which is, would be gnosko. It's, and it's a perfect tense. You absolutely know that those to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, whom you obey, whether of sin that leads to death. The word is, is ice, sin toward death or, the, or that, that leads to death or of obedience that leads to righteousness. verse 17 but God be thanked and again God is articulated we know that this is God Almighty our Heavenly Father God be thanked God be graced or God be thanked the word is grace in the Greek charis the word is actually grace a good translation I guess is but God be thanked but you could translate it God be graced that you were that you were the servants of the old man or the sin nature or, or whatever you want to call it again i prefer to call it the old man that's what the bible refers to it as once again it's articulated but you have obeyed from the heart that form of oh and here's that awful word doctrine which was delivered you the word teaching is the word doctrine in the Greek there is so much in that verse that I mean the nuances in the Greek are just about overwhelming if you look at the English God's thanked that you were the servant of sin also that you have obeyed from the heart. Now, the, the Greek isn't saying that. The Greek is saying that God be graced or God be thanked that you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And I find some Bible teachers 
stumbling over themselves to make sure that you understand that it isn't talking about God being thanked or, or being praised or whatever because you are the servant of sin. And I think you miss a small point there. Uh, you know, maybe it's a large point. If you had never been the servant of the sin, that's the sin, where would there be any need for grace? Where would there be any sense in the verse at all if you hadn't been the slave of the old man? And the great praise is that God has ordained from the beginning of time that you, as a slave of the old man, obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That's what the authorized version says. I don't think that that's what the Greek says. But once again, you know, people argue, well, you're saying this isn't the Word of God. It It is the Word of God. It's translated by people four or five hundred years ago, and this is the way they translated the tip, what we're looking at. The Greek has two possible meanings, and I think most modern translations Many of you will be shocked to hear me say this, but I think most modern translations probably have translated it correctly. It's the fact that you were delivered to that doctrine. You were delivered to that doctrine. Not that the doctrine was delivered to you. You were delivered to that doctrine. Amazing. It is God Almighty who delivered you to that. Not something He delivered you to to you and, and, and you scratched your head and you said, uh, um, well, you know, that, that makes sense. I, I think I'll believe that. Which is basically dogma, not doctrine. That isn't what the text is saying. And it is talking about doctrine. The word teaching is didas didasco, didasco. It's the word doctrine. There's an awful lot in this verse. First of all, it's Doctrine. It's not dogma. It's doctrine. The epistle to the Romans is just is really just being written as we study it here. Many of the New Testament uh, epistles haven't even been written yet. We had the Old Testament scriptures, and we were uh, we were talking about doctrine in the light of the grand truth that God has taken a slave of the old man or a slave of the sin nature whatever word you want to use and made him obedient to righteousness in fact in reality positionally speaking now that is a marvelous revelation of God's grace, but it's done with doctrine. And I happen to live in a generation, and I, well, you do too, where doctrine has almost become the enemy. The word doctrine has become a, a bad word. I don't know how many people have told me that doctrine, Steve, the doctrine is divisive. People can't get along. And it's doctrine that divides them. And properly so. It should. And there is a huge difference between dogma and doctrine. If, if, you, if you folks out there disbelieve what I say, call it dogma, not doctrine. There are, there are several definitions that you could find in the dictionary for dogma. But in our context here, dogma is the proclamation of a church organization of law. And, you know, we can look 
at some of the dogmas. I, I'm going to do it for just a moment to try to try to illustrate this truth. Let's look at at one of the dogmas of the of the. And gosh, I even I, I hate even talking about it. one of the dog, dogmas of the Muslim faith, if you can call it a Muslim faith. One of their dogmas is that, well, it, it's it's that Jesus Christ was a great prophet of God. He wasn't God, but he's a great prophet of God and the Jews. And you had his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And then you had the trial before Pilate, and, and you had the mobs crying out, crucify him, crucify him. I mean, it was just a bad time. Uh, two million visitors in the city of Jerusalem. You know, there was all kinds of, of, of crowds and difficulties, and Jesus slipped away. And the Jews, the them crazy Jews, well, they just they thought that they had crucified Christ. They really didn't, you know. They crucified Judas. They made a a big mistake. Jesus slipped away, and God took him to heaven. He never died. That happens to be the Muslim teaching. Muhammad, who, who couldn't read or write, but he but he spoke it anyway. Now let's look at, at at that. Let's look at that dogma. All right. If that's true, then Jesus Christ is not God, and if he's not God, you don't have a redeemer. But more than that, if that's true, he didn't die. And if he didn't die, you don't have a Savior. And there's no redemption from sin. And and people, I, I've had many of people say to me, well, all Muslims believe like we do. The... Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to use names. But... You know, it, you know, it wouldn't matter to me, you know, Steve, it, it, whether my son or my daughter was of the Muslim faith or the Christian faith or the Roman Catholic faith, you know, because, you know, we're all going to heaven. And that is not true. The dogma that Jesus Christ was never crucified and, and, and was taken to heaven folks, destroys the truth of the Word of God and the very doctrine, the very doctrine that's being taught here. And then we have, you know, well, you know, we, we've got, uh, let's, you know, we got the, the Mormons, okay, for example, the Mormons, that Jesus Christ is a great person. He, he did die. Oh, he died, all right, but he, he wasn't God. They would have no problem with much of what you would say that, that you believe Jesus Christ, you know, concerning Jesus Christ, that, that you believe Jesus Christ died in your place. You know, he did, but he wasn't God. And if he isn't God, if that's, if that's our dogma, and, and that's not doctrine, that's not what this book teaches. This is not what the Holy Spirit was teaching. Then again, we don't have a Savior. We don't have a Redeemer. There's no remission of sin. We are, we are of all men most to be pitied. And then there's, well, there's the dogma of an, of an organization like Romanism. I mean, look. There's there are many dogmas we could look at. You know, one. It, like it doesn't matter where I go. You know, if I mention that Roman Catholics worship Mary, uh, that's just like lighting a fuse. I have never, ever, ever, folks, ever 
never have I ever had a Roman Catholic admit that they worship Mary. In fact, that's, uh, you know, I've got a brother that's, that's a Roman Catholic. That's one thing that they argue against. You know, when people say that, that, well, you just don't understand Romanism. Well, now, wait a minute. Why would any theologian say that a Romanist worships worships Mary? He doesn't. He, he, just, he just says he honors Mary. All right. If Mary is immaculately conceived, then she's without sin. And if she was taken up into heaven without sin, she's God. And so they worship her as God. And they say, no, 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 we don't. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, hold on a minute. There's none good but God. That's my, my Bible says there's none good but God. If Mary's without sin, she's good. And my Bible says there's none good but God. Therefore, she's God. Folks, am I to believe the book or somebody who says, no, I don't worship Mary? You do. You do. If you believe that Mary was immaculately conceived, lived without sin, and was taken without death to heaven, you not only believe that she's equal with God, because she's good, you also believe that this book isn't true because, well, because there's none righteous. There's no none righteous, no, not one. There's not one that seeks after God. And Mary didn't, well, I guess Mary didn't mean it when she called Christ her Savior. And all of a sudden, you can see how a dogma which people take destroys the truth, destroys it. What is being taught here by the Holy Spirit in our text is that Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty, provided a sufficient sacrifice so that you are free from the dominion of the old man. Now, now it's, it's what Morty did. Where there's great theological argument, and, and, and I am not teaching dogma here. I'm doing my, folks, I'm doing my best to teach what I think this book says. And I've said this before, I'll tell you, I'll say it again. I want you to know right up front that I don't have a corner on truth. And your job is not to agree with me. Not in any way to make any attempt to agree with, with some old okey. Folks, your job is to examine the scriptures carefully to see whether or not these things be so. I love the Lord, and I love His Word, and I'm, I'm willing to discuss it with any one of you. But as, as many of you have, have come to realize, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Your job is to decide whether or not these things be so. If I, if I talk with with great theologians, and I, and I don't know who that is, but if I talk with, with those who are in high positions in this area, we aren't made righteous. That's the big argument between Romanism and Protestantism. Infusion of righteous or, or making righteous. My Bible says that he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Now, I, I suppose you could argue that, you know, that is Christ and only Christ. But in the context, it has to be you as a new creation in Christ. 
a new creation in Christ Jesus. The popular Christian thought today in the Protestant church, mind you, is that you really aren't righteous, but God just, God looks at you through Christ. So, you know, you look like you're righteous. And I imagine there's one or two here, you know, who've, of you folks out there who've heard me say that God made you righteous. God declares in Isaiah, Deuteronomy, and Exodus, several passages of, of Scripture, that it is wrong, it is evil to call good evil or evil good. And God Almighty, who declared that in my mind, well, folks, in my mind, cannot call you righteous if you're not righteous. I personally believe that your your new man is righteous. First John tells us that his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. You put on off the old man, God said, that and you've put on the new man. He also declared that if you do righteousness, you're righteous. Righteousness is the product of one who is righteous. And I believe God has perfected you forever. The text, I believe, says you were delivered to the doctrine. The doctrine to which you have been delivered is that God has annulled the power of the old man. And more than that, more than that, you have been born from above so that the new man is righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And that your acts of sin will not have dominion over you any more than the old man will have dominion over you. And that teaching, that doctrine, is based upon the fabulous news that God became flesh. You know, it, it would be an easy thing to write. I, you know, 1 Corinthians 15. I, I, I know what the gospel is. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You know, he was buried and he rose again the third day from the dead according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Hang with me here, folks. But it has to go deeper than that. That, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Well, the Mormons would say that's true, but he wasn't God. Do they then fit the gospel? That, that someone who was not God died for my sins according to the scriptures. No, no. Clearly the scriptures declare that it is God Jehovah who is my redeemer. And so one cannot say he believes the gospel because, because he believes Jesus Christ died for my sins or for your sins. You have to tell me who Jesus Christ is. And folks, it takes a big book to do that. We use things so simple. You know, many times people have said, I, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't need doctrine. I just believe Christ died for my sins. Wait a minute. Who is Christ? And first of all, you, you enter into to great, great thought about whether or not he's God Almighty, incarnate. You consider whether or not he's the, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who hung the stars in the heavens, 
you know, the one who holds you in the hollow of his hand, the one who bottles your tears, who knows the paths that you take, who says that when you're tested, you shall come forth as gold, that, that he is the one who not only created everything, but who holds it together. I'm talking about the supreme monarch of all the ages, or, or, as a Muslim, you believe he was just a prophet of God who escaped crucifixion secretly and was taken to heaven. So your doctrine, folks, begins with Jesus Christ. Then it's died for our sins according to the scriptures. You can't just say he died for your sins. He died for your sins according to the scriptures. So that you were without merit, you weren't seeking God, you weren't working for God, you weren't pleasing God. You were more than that. You were God's enemy. And it was Jesus Christ who, who God declared before the beginning of time that he would bruise the head of the serpent. He was the seed of the woman. But God Almighty, he became flesh that he might be our kinsman. You know, and, and we could go on. But, but, but to just say without doctrine... You can't put uh, according to the scriptures there. He was buried and he rose again the third day from the dead according to the scriptures. Not that they went to the wrong tomb or, or that he fainted and, and resurrected and uh, or, or was resuscitated and, and on and on, you know. No. He died in your place. He was buried so that your sins were carried away, cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. And he rose again victorious over death so that you will not die. That form of doctrine to which you were delivered. The word form there in the English Sometimes we, we make a form, a mold, and we pour wax or metal into it. You know, if you, you, folk, you guys out there who make bullets, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We have a casting, but that's not the word. The word here is the Greek word from which we get our English word type. Type. It's tupos. Judaism had a type of teaching which was through the rabbis and their, their system of pronouncing what they felt the Word of God meant. But what we are delivered to is a different type of teaching, a different form. A different form. Whereas rather than, than being taught by leaders and rabbis, we are taught by the Holy Spirit. The thing that's different here is not just that there's a basic doctrinal difference, but there is a basic difference in how the right form in which we are taught comes through the inner witness of the Spirit. This is the preaching of the gospel through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not through form, not through dogma, not through church organization, not through law. No longer do you go to the priest and, and offer sacrifice. No longer is your, your mediation with a veil between you and the holiest of holies. Folks, it isn't that Judaism was wrong. It's that they made it wrong. Because 
because they didn't realize that was a shadow of the truth. It was a type of the truth. Now you have a different type. Rather than there being a, an earthly priesthood, the body of Christ is, is the priesthood. We are priests, no longer a, a holy of holies, no longer, you know, we have access to God's grace, no longer a recurring sacrifice. That especially comes out full force in, in the book of Hebrews. It, it is the teaching of truth. It isn't an organization. It's not a church organization. It's not a church dogma. It isn't a priesthood. It's the word of God enlightened by the Holy Spirit. That's to that which you've been delivered. You were under the Judaistic uh, system. Well, some of these were. The, these may be all Jews at Rome. I, I doubt that. There, there, uh, there are many who teach that, uh, many who, who teach Romans. There's many that'll say that these are Jews who started the church in Rome. I don't know what they, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know that they were all Jews, but the system is a different type. That's the, why the word here is type, not mold, typos, into which you pour something. The mold is, is into which you pour something. It's our English word type from typos, and we have the teaching of the Holy Spirit. We have the complete word of God, the canon complete, nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. More than that, it's now the full realization of grace. I don't believe that grace is absent from the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, I think it's always the underlying principle. You know, you would have thought, you would have thought, you know, the way that these people acted in the Old Testament, God would have simply destroyed them. And the underlying principle throughout the book is his grace. It's no longer a, a lamb sacrificed repeatedly. It's God Almighty who died in your place. And grace is now absolutely the fundamental underlying principle of the doctrine to which you've been delivered. You've been brought to it. Dearly beloved, God has taken you and presented you to an arena of truth that is absolutely overwhelming. If, if you've been following through in these studies, you've seen this. You were slaves of the old man, and by God's grace, you've been delivered to a type of teaching that, to some, I don't, I don't want to say it's never been there before because it's always been foreshadowed through the law and the prophets. But now it is clearly manifest. What I have to say to you is that God Almighty became incarnate to be your kinsman. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for you so that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I believe the scriptures declare that he did make you righteous. It isn't that he just sees you as righteous even though you're not. You know, none of you are righteous, but God says, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll look at you as righteous. He doesn't do that. In Christ Jesus, 
your sin and mine was laid on Christ and before God we are we stand before God without sin we stand before him holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight it is it's a marvelous doctrine to which we've been delivered why why do those who name the name of Christ in churches across the land, in churches throughout the world, shun doctrine because it may divide? I believe it's because they seek to establish unity for a multitude of reasons, none of which have to do with true unity through sound biblical doctrine because sound doctrine is not popular. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. What Protestants were protesting was that Catholicism had made teaching the domain of the church. When the scriptures teach that doctrine is the domain of the believer, And I think, no, I don't think, I know that that defines and explains much of modern Christianity today. That what many believe is what they have heard in church rather than what they have themselves searched out, what they've searched out for themselves through scripture. A return to Rome A return to Rome. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, well, you know, what does Steve think? You know, who, who cares what Steve thinks? I mean, who even knows who Steve is? The governor of Oklahoma doesn't know who I am, let alone the president of the United States. God knows who I am. It doesn't matter what I think. Please, folks, stand on your own feet. Study the scriptures to show yourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I was talking to someone this past week who, who said, you know, we need somebody like you to teach us the truth. And folks, that scares me to death. You don't need somebody like me to tell you the truth. Our text is showing us that. You have the Holy Spirit and you have the Word of God and you have the immeasurable privilege, the blessed privilege of spending time in it. As much much time as you would a uh, as you would an Oklahoma Thunder game. The only reason I continue to teach this book, folks, is because I love the Lord, and I love His Word, and I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, I just thank you for the opportunity you've given us to just look at your word and to think about it, to meditate on it, to pray about it, to look into those things which you say are true. We love you, Lord. We truly do. Seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray.